us the opportunity just to be friends with him, uh, disciple him. He started developing the spiritual habits a lot in his life, daily getting the word, and that's what changed his life. And so he fell in love with the Lord and wanted to go on and do bigger and better things. And all of a sudden, God moved him. He was always, Matt's a very, looks like a hillbilly up there. Yeah. Um, and, but Matt's a, God's blessed Matt with some serious ideas. Matt's very, very intelligent. I don't never have said that to him before, but I mean that. He's, my, Matt's a smart guy. God's using his smarts in the areas he likes to, to do work with languages and linguistics. So I'm thankful for Matt. And, just take time, bro, and run us through whatever you want to your process, how it works. All right, well, let's start, let's start with the video. Right. We don't have enough translators like us to go around and God is raising up local people um, to do translations in multiple languages so that the expertise that we can bring can be multiplied and the local people who gain expertise in the ability to translate is also multiplied. Papa God looks same Papa God must see at me like making so work. I think I'm asking Adam Sam I'm like him blong God so me and I we have some guys who are very gifted in doing translation. Translation's hard. It's very difficult. And it takes a certain mind to enjoy that and be able to, to do it well. Some la plan the old talk in Satan Bible or some. We must buy him talk place, he must fit him. Let's not talk, now I must come up clear more. This plan, he said, how much true time he bless a work long group. Boom, one time now, son. I hope he read him long time. She's not read him long time, now me too read him long time. But I'm going to work long time, long read him, slow talk place, son. We said, like true long, line him long, she's a no, now line him long, talk place long, I hope too now. One of, one of the things that is challenging for the translators is they have to be connected to their local community. In their villages, everybody knows who they are. And when their translations are published, that translator's reputation and the translation's reputation are always going to be very close to the same thing. And so to be away five months a year is difficult. I work in some garden, work in the house, look at the family. Something where I say, come, I say, lose him long, marry long, I say, I look at him, I start, I say, come. I lose him business long, I lose him family long, I lose him long, I lose him all good people work long, I lose him all good people work long. Obviously our goal in, in all of these places is to transform lives. We want to see people using the scriptures and relating to God as their personal Savior through them. First time you read him, you look him all lap and all smile, all smile, all laugh. Awesome. All, 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 all the time, awesome. you know, you said all laugh. So all the time, 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 all the time. Talk a lot, lot of press, so only talking the same. No need to explain. So talk and make clear. Until I watch the video with y'all, um, it's been going on. This is uh, November of 2020 since I've seen these guys face to face. A lot of them. the people there are not up. And you imagine a pastor not getting to be with his people, the people getting to be with their pastor. When Paul talks about how he how he longs to come to them and be with them, this is what I'm feeling right now is what I assume he was feeling. 
Let me collect myself. <laughs> um, what I wanted to talk about to begin with is some of the some of the why, the reason why we, we do this work of translation. And when Rachel and I were kind of early in this process, I think we were just newly engaged, and we were we were talking about Bible translation, or, or we were talking about missions, and then potentially Bible translation. We weren't sure this is what we were going to do at the time. Um, we kind of felt like God was leading us in that direction um, with my gifts in Greek and Hebrew, um, being pretty proficient with the two of those languages, um, but not sure about linguistics as a whole. I went down to Wycliffe in Orlando to their headquarters to a recruitment visit. And while at that visit, um, they would give me grammar packets of languages that I've never seen before in my life. Collected data of sentences with a free translation of what that sentence meant. And as I looked at those and I compared them, I just had natural gifts that just kind of came to the surface where I could look at what this sentence meant and look at what the next sentence meant and I could find where the noun was or where the verb was, who was doing the action, who was being affected by the action. I could just naturally see those things in the text. And it was this God was whispering to me, hey, I've gifted you for this. Yeah. Are you going to use it for my glory? For my good? And one of the nights while I was there, I was there for I think about five nights, and one of the nights while I was there, a group of us got together and we prayed and we were singing songs to God. We were praising Him and we were praying about this work of Bible translation and how might God have us involved in it. This is not something that Wycliffe had planned. It was just a group of us who were there that we got together and we just we did it on our own. We had a burden starting to grow in our hearts with this, and a number of people who are in that room are now serving around the world. And while we were there singing and we were praying, God laid on my heart Psalm 19. I had no clue why. Just Psalm 19 came to my mind. And I opened it up and I read, there in the midst of all of us, I read Psalm 19. In the first half of this psalm, we see David clearly laying out that God is evidenced in all of creation. And then if we compare that with Romans, we see that because of that evidence in creation that there is a God, that man is without excuse. What man does is that even though he knows God, he presses down that knowledge and that truth and he turns away from it. Man cannot be changed by the evidence of God in creation. But what we do find is in the second half of this chapter in Psalm 19. We see David lay out what does change a man's life. What does change a woman's life and is the Word of God. It is the Word of God that makes him perfect. It is the Word of God that changes his life. And who is that Word of God? None other than Jesus Christ. It's laid out for us there in John that the Word was God. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And that very Word, it came and it dwelt among us. It tabernacled with us. It moved into our neighborhood. Well, there are neighborhoods all over the world where that Word is not there. And so that's why we go. Because we believe that it's the Word of God that changes our lives, that, that shows us our need for a Savior, and that leads us in, to faith and salvation through Christ and Christ alone. And as we grow, we start to learn that that Scripture builds up, that, that it lends itself to other benefits, right? I think a big uh, memory verse from discipleship that I always remember and come back to is the one in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16-17. through 17. And what does it say about all Scripture? That it is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine. What we know to believe. Right? Right belief. What we should believe as Christians. It's so number two. What? Reproof. Helps us see where we're wrong and where we need to realign with, with righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. Number three, correction. Gets us back on that path with Him, walking in righteousness. And the fourth thing, instruction in righteousness. How to continue on that path. Why does it do these things? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, if the Word of God's not there, can these things happen? Maybe. And I think it has in places, but the Word of God in the language 
is going to build is going to is going to lend itself to these benefits for people who otherwise will not heed the word of God. And then I think about Romans 10:13 through 17. Where it talks about those who call on the name of the Lord will be what? They'll be saved. And then it goes on and it says, how shall they call on Him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear unless one preaches to them, right? And how shall one preach unless they're sent? And then you get down to verse 17 and it says, what is... What is <laughs> Hearing comes by the Word of God, right? Well, where does faith come from? In verse 17 it says that it comes by hearing. And how shall they hear unless one's been sent? How can they hear without a preacher? Well, I'll tell you what. We've got a room of preachers in here. But the greatest preacher is this. Mike gets thrown in jail. Heaven forbid if the Bryans get thrown in jail. If Tony gets thrown in jail, man, the Word of God, you can't throw it in jail. It's the greatest preacher of all. And this is why we do Bible translation because guess what? Matthew Woods is going to get old. I've been hearing these preachers talk about how old they're getting. And all their ailments. And I'm not going to be able to ride in that back of that truck and go all the way out to Ottawa. Or out of these back, back bush areas. It's going to get harder and harder the older I get. But man, the Word of God, it never gets sick. Amen. The Word of God, it never has to take a break or a furlough and come home and refresh to go back and do it again. It never comes home because of insufficient, insufficient support. And y'all, I tell you what, we've had a few scares. It's been hard. As much as I love those people, and I love the people of God at home, man, we've had some insufficient support quite often. This last term, one of the things I didn't share on uh, Monday night was this last term right before COVID hit. We got pulled into the office by the director of SILPNG. And this isn't a shame at this church, and I won't mention them by name. They committed to give $12,000 for three years to our ministry. We got year one, and year two rolled around, and we got an excuse. We got called in. We had been living as if that $12,000 was going to come. Doing ministry. Pouring into the lives of those translators, the faces that you saw gathered around those computers, translating God's Word. We got pulled in, and they said, hey, you have a red account that needs to be taken care of. You're in debt to the branch. That doesn't look good to the IRS. I'm in Papua New Guinea and they're worried about the IRS. If you can't get it straightened out, you're going to have to go home. Man, our God is good. Before COVID hit, man, we saw, we went from, I'm just going to be honest with y'all, we went from about $12,000 in debt to $15,000 in the black during COVID. And God provided not through that church, but through individuals who cared about our family, who cared about our ministry, who cared about God's Word, people provided. And we were able to be sustained during that time. We've been sustained so much during that time that I actually got an email when we first got home saying, hey, you got too much money over here. Again, the IRS is worried for anything over $10,000. You need to send some money home. I'm like, what? And I didn't do anything because I want to leave that money there. Tried to ignore it. I got an email yesterday, the same thing. <laughs> so, anyways. And God is good. He's going to support this work. But again, the Bible, this preacher right here, it's never going to go home because of insufficient funds. This right here is going to take on the flesh of the people of Barapu and Ramo and Sisano and Malo and Arapu. It's going to take on their flesh and their tongue and it's going to move into their neighborhood and it's going to dwell among them. And it's going to change lives just like it's changing lives in our churches right here. As people read it, as people hear it, as people submit their lives to the Lord. This right here, it speaks the language better than I will ever learn their language. And the reason that it speaks their language better than I'll ever do it is because of the process of translation that we go through. We don't just say, okay, there's this word endured here. We're going to find a word endured for these people and just put it in there. No, it's a process that we go through. And I'm not 
the one who's doing the translation, but I'm advising the translation. The real translators are those men that you saw gathered around the table. The reason that they're the translators is because they're going to understand their language better than I could ever learn it. I could live with them for 10 years. And I can tell you what, I could study their language, but I will only speak it in a very formal way. I will never be an insider. And man, they'll be proud. They'll be like, man, we got this white man who speaks our language. They'll be proud of that. But I won't sound like them. I will sound like an outsider for the rest of my life, but they are insiders. <coughs> and how better to make the Word of God become an insider in that language than to have mother tongue translators translating the Word of God. Using me as a resource to help that work move forward. And that's what we do. See, when I first went to Papua New Guinea, I, my thought was is that I would do this traditional model where you have the expert call me that. Packs his family up on an airplane. The old days, it used to be a boat. Excuse my heart, it's terrible. He flies all the way around the world to some remote place. And he moves there and he lives for three, maybe four, maybe five years. It depends on the difficulty of the language. Uh, house where we where we work looks. There's a ladder to get up in there. He learns the language and he makes some friends. And eventually, after making friends and discipling some of these people and them starting to walk with Jesus, he he works with the community to select co-translators, if you will. People under him. He does the translation and they give him insight to the language where he is lacking. And over time, what happens is all right, you get the Word of God or the New Testament in most situations with our organization. You get the New Testament. But what we've found in our organization, we've done some research over the many years that we've been working, what we have found is that this model isn't really the best. Now, this model still exists in Papua New Guinea today. There are many that are doing it. They're doing it differently than they used to. But what we've found is in a lot of these places, the scriptures are ultimately not being used. The problem is, is the expert expat doesn't know the language as well as they do. And so what happens is, is instead of it sounding like someone from their place, it sounds like that person who's coming from outside in. It's formal. They're like, this doesn't sound like us. We don't talk like this. And they ultimately reject the scriptures in the long run. Because you know what else happens? Is this expert, where does he go when it's done? He goes back home. To the U.S. or England, the Netherlands. Or Korea, wherever they're from, they go back home. The people are left in the village with a book that does not sound like them. They're not going to read it. Ultimately, they reject it. That's what we found. In a lot of these places, they've got storerooms there in the aid post with stacks of Bibles that have been unsold and unused. Bibles from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Well, I got to Papua New Guinea. And actually kind of before then, I got turned on to this idea of what's called a multi-language project. And this, this situation here is one translator to one language with co-translators from that language. The problem in a place like Papua New Guinea is it would take a millennia to do all the translations if we did it that way. Because you have a translator come in, he spends five years learning the language, and he spends another 15 years doing translation to finish the New Testament. Well, at that point, maybe he's in his 30s when he went, He's getting, he's getting up in age, he's getting close to his 50s, and his kids are going off to college, and he's going home. See the, you see the issue here? See the problem? Well, what happens in a multi-language project is you have a cluster of languages from the area, and they're all working together. Kind of overlap these if I can. And they're collaborating. 
The translators come from each of these different languages or language families. An expert like me, if you could call me that again, comes in, and instead of doing the translation, no, we train the translators from these different language groups to do translation themselves. We come alongside of them with the difficult parts of exegesis, which is a, an expensive Greek term for out of the text, we find the information or the meaning out of the text instead of eisegesis, which is reading the meaning into the text. We help them with the hard parts of exegesis and we lend to them our understanding of Greek, not Hebrew because we're not doing the Old Testament right now. And we equip them to do this work. Now, this right here is drawn for a reason. Because what we want, what I said with this old model is, what happens in the long run is that the Scriptures are not accepted. Well, acceptability is a big portion of why a Scripture is going to be, continue, is going to be used continually or over time. One of the biggest things, and I think we can all agree on this, when we translate Scripture, what's one of the biggest things we want? We want it to be accurate to the true meaning of the Scripture, right? That's number one. If it's not accurate, then we're giving them something less than the Scripture, right? So we can say accuracy. I'm going to abbreviate it here. ACC. I hate the ACC, but accuracy I love. Accuracy. The Word of God that we send, that we, that we work so diligently to produce for the people in their language, it stands up on the accuracy to the original manuscripts, the Greek, and if it's the Old Testament, the Hebrew. All right, But it doesn't stand on, on accuracy alone because we, we would look at this, this translation here that's rejected by the people ultimately, and we would look at it and we would look at the exegetical choices they made and the different things that they did and we say, man, it's accurate to the original articles. But ultimately it's rejected. Why? What's the problem here? Well, the problem is, is that, it, that it wasn't natural. It didn't sound like a person from X language. And so what we understand now throughout the years a translation that's been going on is that accuracy is also girded up by a foot. I'll go a different direction with that. It'll look funny. Accuracy is girded up by naturalness. Okay? This isn't accepted because it's not natural. It's too, too formal, too literal, too wooden. It doesn't sound like the mama who's selling carrots at market or sago at market. It sounds like the white man who came from outside in. And then there's other issues that get pointed out. And these are issues of clarity. And what I mean by clarity... Don't get the two confused because naturalness and clarity could kind of blend together a little bit. But what I mean by clarity is how do they put important units of prose together or poetry together? What does it look like or how do they do it in their, in their culture or in their language? And an example that I shared with Brian the other day, and hopefully this will communicate. We use these clauses or groups of clauses that are called a reason and a result all the time in our language. We say, I went to the store because I needed groceries. Well, in my language, the most important clause in that structure has got to come last. But in the other two language communities, the language families that we work with, guess what they do? They would say, I got groceries when I went to the store. Or they would, they would flip it around on its head. It sounds funny if I was to say it. I got groceries, well, how would we say it? I, I went to the store because I needed groceries. I needed groceries, therefore I went to the store, they would say, or something like that. If they say it the other way around, it's not clear. 
The most important piece needs to go first for them or go last for them. And so we have to weigh these things. We have to consider the linguistics of their language. The way that they would do it so that it is clear when they read it. And then the last thing that I've spoke about already. Excuse me, that looks really bad. Is acceptability. Now acceptability... You're going to bear with me. I don't know how to there. Acceptability. I'm running out of space. Acceptability is important. Now, I talked about it not being accepted because naturalness fell out. Something that I think you heard in the video was uh, what John Nystrom said. What do you say about the translators in the scriptures? When we're done with this, what's going to happen? The reputation of the translator is going to become the reputation of the scriptures. And so what we find is these men are having to balance life in the village with this task of Bible translation. See, in places like Africa, it, it's, a, it's fairly easy because you get educated men to move to the city and he works with a translator and they just crank it out, man, in a couple of years. But in a place like Papua New Guinea, my translators have an age, uh, a grade level education between 6th grade and some have 12th grade. You're talking about people with a sixth grade education doing Bible translation. Now they're not just jumping into Bible translation. They're getting training before they go there. And we're pouring over it. I'll get into that in a minute. So the process is slow for us. It's slow because these men, they'll come for a month and they work hard. And in order to keep a good reputation where they live, they go back and they live in their community. They help people build houses, work their gardens. They take, take part in their, in their community governance and in their churches. Because we want them to have a good reputation. If they left and they moved away and they worked hard for five years, their reputation would go way down. And that would end up affecting the acceptability of the translation. If they are in sin, open sin in their community, that would affect the acceptability of the translation. And so this is a, a big part of producing the Scriptures. Each of these things affect the Word of God. Not so much the accuracy, but the Word of God. Now to get a little bit into the process that we have there in Idaho. Back in the 80s, John Nystrom, one of the men that you saw in the video, he moved amongst the Ara people with the traditional model, the one that I talked about earlier, where one translator goes and works with one language. He moved there amongst the Ara people and he started doing Bible translation. And over the years that he was doing Bible translation, he would have the Malo people and the Sisano people and the Barapu people come and say, hey, we would love to have translation in our, in our language start to, to take place. And John would say, well, I'm just one man. And I'm very busy with the translation here. I will continue to pray with you that God will send men to do the work of Bible translation. That he will send people to do the work of Bible translation with your language communities. Well, God ended up answering these prayers. But not in the way you would have expected. In 1998, there was a major, a major earthquake offshore. And that major earthquake created three nine-meter tsunami waves that came through and washed the beach, of, the beaches of Arab, Malul, Barapu, and Sisano. And many people lost their lives. You take a group like Barapu who had... I want to say somewhere around 10,000 people at the time dropped down to a few thousand people because the tsunami killed them, threw them against the coconut trees, washed their houses away, washed their canoes away. But two of the translators survived. And the government came in and they helped clean up stuff and they moved the aid posts from the beach to their gardens, inland, on the other side of the lagoon. And, 
And they moved their schools. And they moved their churches there. And so people ultimately ended up moving their homes there. So did the Barapu people. So did the Sisano people. So did the Malo people. They all moved their homes to where their gardens were. You know what happened? They got closer to other languages that were there in the bush. Languages that also did not have translation going on. And these two men, burdened by this catastrophe, said, John, we need to take the Scriptures to these other people as well. We need to find a way to start Bible translation. We do not need another person to lose their life without knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And so then they set out on this adventure of, well, how do we do Bible translation in a big group setting? Because the hard part in these three rings that I had drawn is this is one language family. And the languages in this family are similar to one another. But this language family is not like this one. And this language family is not like these. Within their group, they're the same. Well, that, that creates some complexity. How do you do translation when a language is not similar to one another? How do you expedite that process while we've found a way? And it's been really neat. And I hope to lay that out for you clearly here. I've kind of toyed around with a couple different ways of showing this, and I'm going to try the new way that, I, that I've thought up. So hopefully it works out. <laughs> Um, please ask questions if you have them while I'm drawing this. Early on in our process, what we do is we start with the Arab people. They've been translating for the longest time. These troop translators are still involved in the program. They're getting older in age. So what we're hoping is we're training new guys to come alongside them and kind of pass on their expertise to them to join us in this work. But the first thing that we do is John Nystrom works with the Arab people, those two translators, and they produce the auto translation. They use the Greek, they work together, and they produce the auto translation. And out of the art of translation, they create what we call a BT. Now, BT is what we call a back translation. What a back translation is, is it's supposed to give an outsider insight to what's in the talk place translation. That's a talk person word for language of the place. And it is in talk person. I'm fluent in talk person. John Nisham's fluent in talk person. Ben Pearson, our other teammate, teammate that works with the other language family, he is proficient in talk person. We've got other consultants that are also proficient in talk piston, and so what we do is we come and we check this. Now, have no fear. We have two translators. <coughs> one does this one, and then the other comes alongside and evaluates this one and creates the back translation. It's not the same man doing this, it's different men. So that this man might catch things that are wrong when he produces the back translation. So that when I come and I read this, I can say, hey, wait a minute. That's not what Paul's trying to say here. What Paul is saying is this. And we correct it. And then the auto translator comes back. And he sees that change. And he reflects the change in his talk, in his talk place translation. You tracking with me so far? It's about to get crazy. All right. So we pour over this back translation. There's, there's me. There's John Nystrom. There's Ben Pearson. There's a consultant who worked and has finished the translation in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Matt Graham, who lives in Dallas, Texas. He, tra he checks the back translation. And then we have another guy, Brad Voltmer, who also finished a translation in Papua New Guinea, who is also coming alongside of this and helping us check. So we've got eyes on top of this, eyes on top of eyes that are looking at this, trying to make sure that nothing gets through that should not be there in the text. After that's gone over, initially, we've got some initial drafts that are very, very thoroughly checked and in good condition. And then what we do, we pass that on to these other translations. Okay? So, the languages that are like Arab, Malol and Sisano, they're both Austronesian languages. It's just a the name of that family of languages, they stretch from Madagascar all the way up to Polynesia. 
the biggest, the, the largest swath of a language family in the world. They're spread out. They're not huge populations, but the Austronesian family of languages are spread across. And the reason we know that is because there are languages in, in Madagascar that when they count, five is this word. And you start looking at some of these other Austronesian languages that are stre stretched all the way over here. And the same word, basically, is in their language. Five, and it's hand, basically. Now, I mean, I think you'd find hand for a lot of languages would be the number. For, the, number the word for hand is the same for the word for five. But what I'm saying is the look of the word for five is the same in Madagascar as it is for this language over here. It's very, very interesting. But what we find is the people from Sisanoa Malo, they do what we call an adaptation from Ara into their language. Now, they're not the same language, but they do have words in common because, one, they live close to each other, and they're from the same family of languages. So there's similarities. But there's enough differences that they're their own language and they need their own translation. Okay? Cool. So they adapt this text into their language. Malo and Sisano. Okay, well, Matt, what, what are these other languages that are from the other two language families? What do they do? <coughs> what they do is they take this back translation that has also been thoroughly checked, just like the auto translation, and they also adapt the text into their language. But they do it from Tokpisin into their language. Now, there's a tool in Paratext that we use to do these initial drafts. And in that tool, Paratext, they have what's called an interlinearizer. Long word, right? You know what an interlinearizer is? It's, um, it's typically it's a text where you have one language on top, and underneath you have glosses for the words, or you may have groups of words that have a gloss with a phrase. So they're interlinearized, so that you can see it. A lot of Greek texts, so that way you can go to a Christian bookstore, you probably could find an interlinearized Greek to English book. What they do is they import, Malo and Cicero import Ara. The other groups import the BT into this interlinearizer tool, and then they start to adapt those words back into their language all the way through. When a verse is done, they approve it. Boom. It gets spit into their, into their talk place translation just like auto. So what we have is we have initial draft. So, but you also have here, let's see, we got... Onale, I'm spelling that wrong, and Sco, Sco languages. They use the BT. But this is, this is the step in the process, this first step. The initial draft, they use an interlinearizer, and they do it. And then after they've created their drafts in their language, they also have another translator who comes alongside of them, just like the auto, a second translator who creates a back translation for their initial drafts in their language. So they'll have, so for example, Barapu will have their translation, their text, and then they will also have a BT. Okay? And at this step, once they've completed their BT, I use an interlinearizer tool to gloss from the back translation into their language, and then I start connecting. And I'm, st I'm learning Barapu and Ramo and um, Po. I'm learning these languages. Again, I'll never speak it well, but I can see things grammatically that are askew that they often don't see. For example, there was one where um, when we were translating John 1, they were talking about how the light came. Okay? They're in John 1 to earth. And in that verb for came, they had a feminine marker for light. Now, in their language, that's natural for them to put the feminine marker on light because light is, in their language, feminine. But that light in this situation is who? It's Jesus. And is Jesus a woman? No, he's not. Now, oftentimes, linguistic gender does not correlate to physical gender. But in this situation, I say, hey, guys, this maybe is out in the left field, but can we do this? Can we try this? Can you put a masculine marker there to maybe kind of tip your hat to say, this light is different than normal light? This light is pointing to something other than just light. 
like the sun coming up. And so what ended up happening is they took it in the next process, they, they changed it there, and in the next step of the process, <coughs> we printed out their drafts after that workshop, and they took it out, and they did village checking. It's part of that acceptability. We want as many of the people in the village involved in this process because what do we want? We want ownership on the part of the people. We want this, this translation, these translations that are produced to be theirs. Not some white man who came from America, but theirs. And so people give input, they listen. Now they're not changing the exegesis of the text. What they're listening for is naturalness. What they're listening for is clarity. Does it sound like us? Is that the way that we would say that? And then they give input. We don't always take their, their suggestions. But man, sometimes there's some suggestions that are really good. And they help the text um, as they would say, cry good. Me cry all same neck blown, me pla. It sounds like our neck, the way we talk. And that's what we want. We want it to have the neck of the people. And so when the village checking is done, they come back and we have our first set of revisions. And during, during all this village checking, I'm also working. I'm pouring over the text more, trying to see if there's other things that maybe have fallen through the cracks, things that I didn't see initially when I went through the text. And I'm sending notes to the guy saying, hey, look at this. What about this? Have you considered this? And then we get there and they make revisions based upon the village check, upon my advisor check that I've done. They make revisions. And then also during that same workshop, we do a team check. Now this team check, what happens there, so this village check is helping with this, this, and also this. So I know I erased it because I needed room on the board, but it's, it's helping with naturalness, it's helping with clarity, and it's helping with, that, with acceptability because people are involved and it's sounding like them. This part here is working on this part, the accuracy. We're doing a team check. We're looking at it. We're having communicate. We're communicating with one another based upon maybe insights that we got from different places. Well, so and so from my place said, "Have you tried this?" And we tried it, and Ben checked it, and he's approved it. Would that work for you? And other guys are like, "Wow, yeah, we could do that too." And then they adopt. They adopt that change. But these team checks have been a great opportunity for that, but also for training. Or maybe we found, I found something in the exegesis of the text that was askew. And in this team check, we bring it up as a discussion and amongst the group and we talk about, well, what do you think here? And what do you think? Looking at the text, how would we do that? How would we say that and be, be accurate to the original manuscripts? And we get insight from them. And we train them on how to look for these things. How to discuss them. <clears throat> and then from there, after that workshop... So this is the first, well, this happens between workshops. This is the first workshop with that new text. This is the second workshop with the new text. They can have another village check. I'll give a black pen. During that village check, again, we're working on the naturalness, the clarity, and the acceptability of the text. And they find more things. Maybe not. And then after that village check, they come back and they prepare the text. They make revisions, if there are any. And they come back and they prepare for consultant checking. Shorthand. And then after that preparation for consultant checking, the next quarter, so these are in different quarters of the year. So this might be, typically this is taking place in the third quarter of the year, fourth quarter of the year, first quarter of the year, 
And then the second quarter of the year, so January, February time period, somewhere in there, so we, our year starts in October. What ends up happening is we have our consultant checking. This has changed because of COVID. John and Mac typically come to the consultant checking. And what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to pull in Papua New Guinean consultants to give them more experience checking. So that if we're ever called home, if we're, the government becomes hostile to expats coming in and doing this work, that maybe they could carry the torch and continue on. That's what we're about, right? Reproducing what we're doing in others. That's what I hear Brian talking about with the God would raise up the next generation to carry forth his plan. This is what we want to do. We want to reproduce what we have in others so that they can reproduce it as well. And so we bring in Papua New Guinean consultants to help us in this process. And we consult and check. And so what we do is we kind of do that exegetical process that we do right here. We do it here again, but we don't just do it with auto. We do it with all 11 languages at one time. And it's a really neat process. Well, I shouldn't say all 11 at one time. My guys are so different than the rest of them. And what I mean, well, if you want to know how, how different they are, I'll talk about it later. I don't want to get away from this. But my guys, they check typically. And then after we've checked, then the other groups check because they're similar enough. Now, they are different, but they're similar enough they can check together. And then what happens is, is those notes that we get from one group goes out to every group. And everybody considers those consultant notes and makes changes if need be. So these are often questions like, read this section. What does Jesus mean when he, when he says this? Or example, one that popped into my head. And Mike and I were talking about it this morning. When, uh, when Andrew is under the, or not Andrew, when Nathaniel's under that tree. And he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, in our places, a lot of our languages can't ask that question. Because that question would sound like a question that you want to, you want an answer, yes or no. That, that's not a yes or no question. It looks like one, but what Nathaniel's really saying is something else. And we might talked about that. <laughs> um, no, right? I mean, yes, the answer is no, but it's like Nazareth is a terrible place. There's no way that anything good has ever come from there and ever will come from there. there there's a lot behind that. It's not just a question. And so for our people to say that question, it would just be a yes or no question, that'd be it. Yes, no, I don't know. There's not anything, there's no guts behind it. And so we have to strip that away for them. And bring out the, the implied meaning. Because they won't make, they won't make the jump to what's being inferred there. So anyways, um, after that consultant checking, the process still isn't done. What we have next is they make more revisions the next workshop. And as they finish those revisions that the consultants give to them, they record. Put it down in audio. And that audio goes onto their micro SDs and it gets distributed amongst the people. It goes onto proclaimers. And these proclaimers are then used out in the villages. Man, I've got a story that, that, that I wasn't even planning on sharing that I want to share with you. I was out in the village in Barapu. And I took with me 10 proclaimers. They cost $20 each, or 20 kina each. And I'm sitting there and I'm playing one of them. And within a matter of seconds, I had 20 kina notes falling right in my lap and all of the proclaimers gone like that. I was baffled. We got a whole broke down deep freeze in auto full of these things. Why are they not out and amongst the people? They want them. And so then what we did is after I left and went back, I sent my guys back out with like 25, 30 of them. And at 5 a.m. the next morning, I get a phone call from, from my literacy court, my literacy guy from Baderpoon. He says, hey, Matt, I need more. They're gone. I've sold every last one of them. The people want it. And they love to hear God's word in their language. They want, it's, it's bringing change into their lives. And so we record. And it's neat because... Not only are they getting the recorded scriptures, but in this process, we're finding other things that maybe don't sound so natural. Because as they're reading the text, they're like, oh, 
ah, that sounds funny. I should say it like this. So we're not talking about exegetical changes here. We're talking about naturalness changes, the way the language speaks. And so there might be some small changes, nothing big, nothing that would go from one language to the next, just in theirs as they record. And they quickly make those changes. And, uh, you know, guys like me would get a note saying they made a change, and I'd go and look, and I'd approve it. And we'd move on. And then from here, this is what we want. This is kind of the end of the Bible translation process. Now, I continue, the work continues on beyond this, but this is where we're, as translators, are moving towards. The translation advisors is the typesetting and printing. And then distribution of the scriptures into the place. And I got right here, I want you to see some of these. We'll pass them around. You can look at them. Here is um, some of Cicino and uh, Bounty Po and uh, Bounty Barabu and Uniramu. Some of the different language groups. These are the ones that I work with. These are, these are some of the volumes that we're distributing out amongst the people. So take a look. It probably won't mean much for you, but what you have in here is on the outside, you have the language of the place. And on the inside, you have Tokpisan. And the reason we did the diglot form like this is because a lot of them have experience reading the Tokpisan Bible. And they need to see how this is similar. What we've done is similar because if it's not similar to the Bible, the Bibles they've already seen, then acceptability is going to erode the foundation of them ever using these. And then also, it helps people. Like a man from Barapu may marry a woman from Aro. And she may know a little bit of Barapu, but having the Tokpisin right here will help her learn more of the Barapu. So it's really neat. Take a look at it. Um, they're right here on this table. We can pass them around if you want. But uh, yeah, this is, this is kind of our process. And I don't have a... <laughs> this is kind of all I have for you. The hope is, is that the work would not stop right here. Right? The hope is that as the word goes out, that what would happen? That what we have there in Romans chapter 10, right? Would take place. That people would start to call upon the name of the Lord and that they'd be saved. That they would be able to read the word of God and hear the word of God and believe in, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Because there may come a day where missionaries do not go. There may come a day where the church is persecuted and people have to go underground. But I tell you what, this can be persecuted and stand strong. It can be memorized and passed on. This right here doesn't take a break. It doesn't leave. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't run out of funds. No, it stays in the home and in the hearts of the people who read it and submit to it. Our hope is, is that the work wouldn't stop with a translation in hand, but it would continue on going further and further and further out and just spreading out throughout the, nations of Pap the nation of Papua New Guinea and the different nations of people that are there in that country. And then it would sweep the world like, like a fire. People would have the Word of God in the tongue that they heard their mama speak to them from the time they were a baby. That the Holy Spirit would take those words and pierce to the depth of their soul. They'd be convicted of sin. That they would repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. That's our hope. This is our process. Thank you all for listening. about the consultant checking and just what that looks like. So I think yeah. that's a really cool process. Sorry. Yeah, so what happens there is, um, so my guys go, um, we don't have our translators do the checking with the consultant. What happens in this process, again, trying to extend that arm of acceptability to give a foundation to this Bible translation work, we request that the community select people to come and be, be checked against the translation. So what I mean by that is, we, we call them language consultants. We give them a title and they feel, you know, oh, yeah, I'm a consultant of my language. They come in and we would ask them the questions. We'd say, okay, let's read verses, um, in John chapter four, let's read uh, 
verses 1 through 6. I don't know if that's a, an actual, you know, section. I mean, I know that there's verses 1 through 6, but I'm saying, like, I don't know if that's like a, a unit that you, would, that you would break it down. I'm just pulling out of thin air. But we would say, hey, let's read that. And what would happen is, Bounty Barapu would read it. Bounty Po would read it. Uni Rama would read it. And Boni Sumo would read it. Okay, and what would happen there is after it's read, we would look at these consultants. And the translators are there with them sitting on either side of these consultants. And we would look at the consultants. We're not looking at the translators. We would say, hey, based upon the reading of this passage, what is, what is Jesus saying to so-and-so? We're eliciting information based upon what they read in the text. Because we want to make sure that the plane is landing where it's supposed to land in the language. And they'll give us input. And then we say, okay, very good, very good. And they may be completely off base. It may be like, you know, uh, it may be some off the wall kind of response. And we're like, well, that definitely missed the mark. But it looks like the translation is actually good. And then we'll ask the next group. We'll say, okay, well, is that what you got? No. They'll, they'll be like, no, uh, in ours, I have this. And we're like, okay, good. That's what we're looking for. And then the other guy will go, oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I misread this. That is, oh, a little shamed, but he's like, yeah, that's what that means. And then the next group, yeah, next group, no, we have this. Okay, well, we need to make a note there, and then I'll send out a note right on the spot. The other consultant's checking. I'll type up a note and then send it, and then I'll send it to all of the groups saying, hey, make sure here that you don't have this mistake. So-and-so had it. Let's make sure we don't, okay? And so that's kind of that process. It goes around, and then the next group, they'll start the reading on the next section, Everybody reads it, and then we ask them the question, and then we go around the room, making sure that everybody has either the same response or a different response based upon what we're looking for from our question. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty rigorous process. I hope that's what you see, that this isn't, you know, we're not like slip slopping paint on the wall. No offense, Bob. Um, but <laughs> but we're, we're walking slowly through this. This is a process, and it takes years. And, and Bible translation is... is, is is what we're there. It's the work that we're there to do, but what we want more so is we want to train these men to go and do this same process elsewhere. Because there's a lot of languages in PNG. 840 languages. Not dialects. There are dialects within those languages. 840 languages in Papua New Guinea. There's still somewhere between 250 to 300 language needs for translation to start. So you got languages like ours that are in process right now of those 840. There's a big need. And we're not going to do it. We're not going. It's getting more and more expensive for us to go over there.